This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. This is Eisenhower at Edwards, and we are finally tackling the actually somewhat threadbare topic of Eisenhower, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, supposedly visiting with aliens at Edwards Air Force Base in early 1954. Now, we touched on this briefly in our episode about uh, the Borderline Science Research Associates, because that's where this rumor initially started. But we're going to look more at their actual publication that came out in 1973 of the documentation surrounding that and the channeled messages that followed. And then we're going to look at some of the ways the rumor, the theory, the claim that Eisenhower met with aliens at Edwards Air Force Base developed over the years. So that's what we're going to be doing. We might as well get started. So it's been a few years since we looked at Mead Lane and his friend Gerald Light, who wrote the letter explaining what had happened at Edwards Air Force Base. We talked about them in our episode on the Borderland Science Research Associates. Oh, gosh, four years ago? Probably four years ago. It's called A Good Old Fashioned Ether Frolic, and you can find a link to that episode in the show notes. But basically, this was an organization that was very much of a spiritualist bent. It began in the 1940s. It actually predated the flying saucer craze by a few years. And basically, the Borderland Science Research Associates were investigating the then new flying saucer phenomenon from the perspective of these ships not being from outer space, but rather from the ether, from some dimension between our dimension and a higher dimension sort of pushing through. And they had contact with a number of what they called controls, um, people, beings, ascended masters, what have you, who would communicate to them by channeling through a man, usually through a man named Mark Probert. And there were a number of these, uh, of these individuals. We'll hear from two of them today. In that episode, we did talk about the letter that a man named Gerald Light sent to Mead Lane explaining that he had been at Edwards Air Force Base when UFOs had landed. But in 1973, a booklet, sort of spiral-bound booklet called Flying Saucers at Edwards Air Force Base 1954 was published by the BSRA at that point under the leadership of a guy named, I think at that time, Riley Crabb. And I got a PDF of this booklet from a listener on Twitter, which I'm very grateful for. And the booklet starts out with a somewhat rosy, optimistic look back at what the 1950s were like for ufology. The early 1950s were exciting years for the UFO awakened in California. George Adamski was having his sightings and contacts at Palomar and out in the desert. Orfeo Angelucci was using Glendale for a takeoff for space trips to one of the asteroids. Paul Vest had his interview with a Venusian in Santa Monica. Visitors to Giant Rock were being taken up into hovering spaceships via a magnetic etheric tube through George Van Tassel's medium ship, and Mead Lane was being overwhelmed with sighting and contact data in San Diego. What's fun is I think we have covered all of those things on various episodes, even journalist, in quotes, Paul Vest and his interview with a Venusian. I think that was part of our Orfeo Angelucci episode. And then Crab launches into the subject of this booklet. Then there was the saucer flap at Edwards Air Force Base in the Muroc Dry Lake area of the high desert. This was in the spring of 1954 and apparently lasted for months. Frank Edwards, radio newscaster in the Midwest, had word of a January landing of UFOs at some military base in California. Crab goes on to recount the story, which he has not actually presented in full in the form of Light's original letter. It's a weird sort of out-of-order telling of the story. But he makes it clear that even though 
Gerald Light or Dr. Light, not the villain and or hero from DC Comics, but Gerald Light, the medium, even though he broke security by telling people this, he was the only one, even though there were other witnesses, he was the only one who would talk. Others who made the privileged visit to Edwards in the spring of 1954 told the truth to close friends, no doubt, and some even made a few guarded remarks in public. There is no use trying to get anything out of the three Angelinos who accompanied Light to Edwards. Other saucer researchers have tried. Letters are not even acknowledged. Crab continues by explaining what corroborating evidence there was for this. And this corroborating evidence is is fairly is is fairly bad. Probably the, the most of it takes the form of other people having talked about the stuff that's in Light's letter, even though Light's letter was the only place where these things were published. One example is Desmond Leslie, uh, George Adamski's co-author on his first book and friend of contactees, did an interview with George Hunt Williamson in, guess what, Valor magazine from the Soulcraft organization from about a month ago or two months ago when we talked about William Dudley Pelly. He sort of talked about an expanded version of what happened at Edwards Air Force Base, said that uh, Leslie had done a little saucer research and discovered that the saucer at Edwards was actually there, kept under guard in Hangar 27. So, Hangar 18 plus 9 or something like that. He spoke to an Air Force man who had seen the craft and um, said that there was a lot of secrecy. And after talking about some other things, mostly about the planet Mars and Cedric Allingham's book, where he met a man from Mars, we covered Cedric Allingham um, a long time ago, he finishes up and leads into the actual letter from Gerald Light with this little bit of paranoia. It's a good bet that the home of every UFO researcher and every known contactee is pinpointed on detailed area maps of this nation. If a magnetic vortex or space warp triggers the surveillance system, government agents know it immediately and are on their way. Sadly, as this was written in 1973, we don't have a reference to black helicopters being dispatched to um, the homes of contactees and UFO witnesses. And sort of a side note, there was a black helicopter flying a little low over the Chizo Media Studios uh, two days ago. I think it was just a helicopter that was black and not a true black helicopter, but I'm wondering if there was a magnetic vortex or a space warp that uh, happened here that brought the government agents in to investigate. So we're five pages in to this booklet, and we get to the letter to Mead Lane from Gerald Light, which, according to the notes on the copy of the letter, Lane received April 16th, 1954. And we covered this in our episode about the BSRA, so I'm using the audio clip of the letter from that. So if it's a little different style or a little different quality, that's the reason. This is what Gerald Light said to Mead Lane. My dear friend, I've just returned from Murak. The report is true. Devastatingly true. I made the journey in company with Franklin Allen of the Hearst Papers and Edwin Norse of Brookings Institute and Bishop McIntyre of Los Angeles. Confidential names for the present, please. When we were allowed to enter the restricted section after about six hours in which we were checked on every possible item, event, incident, and aspect of our personal and public lives, I had the distinct feeling that the world had come to an end with fantastic realism. For I have never seen so many human beings in a state of complete collapse and confusion as they realized that their own world had indeed ended with such finality as to beggar description. The reality of the other plane, arrow forms, is now and forever removed from the realms of speculation and made a rather painful part of the consciousness of every responsible scientific and political group. During my two days' visit, I saw five separate and distinct types of aircraft being studied and handled by our Air Force officials with the assistance and permission of the Ethereans. I have no words to express my reactions. It finally happened. It is now a matter of history. President Eisenhower, as you may already know, was spirited over to Muroc one night during his visit to Palm Springs recently. It's my conviction that he will ignore the terrific conflict between the various authorities and go directly to the people via radio and television if the impasse continues much longer. 
From what I could gather, an official statement to the country is being prepared to deliver for delivery. From what I could gather, an official statement to the country is being prepared for delivery about the middle of May. I will leave it to your own excellent powers of deduction to construct a fitting picture of the mental and emotional pandemonium that is now shattering the consciousness of hundreds of our scientific authorities and all the pundits of the various specialized knowledges that make up our current physics. In some is instance... In some instance, I could not stifle a wave of pity that arose in my own being as I watched the pathetic bewilderment of rather brilliant brains struggling to make some sort of rational explanation which would enable them to retain their familiar theories and concepts. And I thanked my own destiny for having long ago pushed me into the metaphysical woods and compelled me to find my way out, to watch strong minds cringe before totally irreconcilable aspects of science is not a pleasant thing. I had forgotten how commonplace things as such as I had forgotten how commonplace things as dematerialization of solid objects has become to my own mind. The coming and going of an etheric or spirit body has been so familiar to me these many years that I'd forgotten that such a manifestation could snap the mental balance of a man not so conditioned. I shall never forget those 48 hours at Muroc. And so that's the story. And it's pretty basic. Um, there's nothing about agreements or we don't know any details about the conversation. There's a sense that the government is going to reveal everything, but we know that never happened. It's interesting, especially when we consider how things are going to develop in the future. So at the same time, the same date, April 16th, um, 1954, that, that um, this letter was, uh, was, was composed, there's another letter, or was received by Lane, another letter is being composed on April 16th by... Gerald Light to send to Mead Lane, where he's talking about the newsletter he's getting ready to send out to his readers. Gerald Light had a, a newsletter about etheric and flying saucer subjects. And things take a very sort of political turn that isn't at all evident in the initial letter. I am now preparing bulletin number two for mailing about Monday. I will add my testimony of the Muroc episode for whatever it may be worth, and then go into some length about the big move of the commies to take advantage of the present public concern about the bomb. My information is that a vigorous campaign will be started immediately to persuade America that communist domination is much better than total annihilation. This will emanate from various groups of intellectuals who certainly have a case to present. The purpose behind this campaign is something I was warned about nearly 30 years ago. Its particular intent, among other things, is to split the country into as many warring sections as possible. There is, of course, the ancient prophecy of America becoming a land of four separate nations or peoples. These have sometimes, rather simply, been itemized as a north-south-east-west division. And anyone with an ounce of ingenuity can easily fan local differences into a terrible hate. This is the time for a display of that Christian idealism about which we are so proud, lest the jungle consciousness in each of us destroys every vestige of our sanity. I am working against a deadline to have another pamphlet on Etheria to serve as a companion book to Sing Skies when the news breaks next month and mob hysteria follows its traditional course. This is just a hasty roundup of the matter as it stands now, and I will keep in touch with you for further cooperation. Will you please send me your phone number? It has vanished from my files in the confusion around here. Cordially and fraternally, GL. Now, until I received this and read through it a few times, I had no idea that the Edwards Air Force Base stuff would, would sort of be, be dropped fairly quickly in this correspondence between Light and Lane. We, we, we sort of forget about the landing itself and, and talk about this the threat of a better red than dead campaign to, to dredge up that old phrase from the Cold War that nuclear annihilation is a worse option than the communists winning. But there is some some political stuff here that I was I was honestly uh, honestly not expecting. <laughs> 
from here, the book is going to go into some material about this with the channeled entities being uh, being in communication with members of the BSRA. But before that, I want to just give you a little taste of how some other saucer publications handled news of this. There was a reference to the supposed Edwards Air Force Base landing in the very first issue of Nexus, Jim Mosley's first attempt at a flying saucer magazine or newsletter. Interesting of True Department, latest wild rumor from the coast is that five saucers landed voluntarily out there at an airbase, and that the little men piloting them hung around long enough to be questioned by top brass. The story goes on that Ike made a secret visit to those gentlemen from space while supposedly vacationing at Palm Springs. We can't say that we believe this one, but lots of rumors lately all point to the fact that the government does know a whole lot more about saucers than they're telling. More on this in later issues. Seems to me to be a very sensible take on the entire topic from Jim Mosley, as is to be expected. We're big fans around here, as most of you know. So then... The book, Flying Saucer at Edwards Air Force Base, 1954, goes into the channeling section, which takes up a good three quarters of the book. The first channel, uh, first being being channeled, is Ramon Natale, and Ramon goes into, oh, details about nuclear bombs and the hydrogen bomb and how it will mess up gravity and general sort of contacty-ish kind of things. And then Mead Lane, who is there taking part in this, I almost said seance, in this channeling session, asks about the issue of Edwards Air Force Base, which is near Muroc Dry Lake Bed. So sometimes what you'll see in stories like this is that Edwards and Muroc get used interchangeably, but it was officially Edwards Air Force Base by this point, even if people didn't necessarily call it that. And another thing I should mention is that we did get secret recordings of these channeling sessions, but the channeled audio is a little weird and glitchy and etheric, uh, as befits Ethereans. So we are aware of the, um, of the, of the effect that it seems to have. And, uh, we did our best to clean it up, but we did receive these recordings in a nondescript box from a man wearing all black who called himself He didn't call himself anything, actually. It was very strange. Have you been present at Muroc lately? We have been there many times and have known what was going on there. Several months ago, there were certain things we had to say to you, but conditions could not be arranged so we could get together. However, it was better so, and I am of the opinion, and I know all of us in the inner circle are of the same opinion, that it would be wiser not to put any of this out to the public. That includes what is in Dr. Light's letter? That is what I am saying. I believe Dr. Light is intending to publish in some form a statement. Not all of it was in that letter which I read, which perhaps you heard, but there are some portions of it at any rate. Well then, I would suggest that you and he arrive at what you think is possible to certain individuals, and that will be enough. Of course, it's quite plain that what has taken place at Muroc will leak out. It is better, sir, that it leaks out through somebody else than you. What leaks out is almost certain to be distorted and misunderstood. That is also to be reckoned with. That is correct. I agree. But if you do give out this thing, these writings of good Dr. Light, it would be better that you send them only to a very chosen few. That was my intention. If we printed anything at all after consultation with Dr. Light, we would send it only to members of our group, our associates, and particularly those whom we consider responsible. And I am suggesting that one of these be the man Desmond Leslie. So you've got to be really careful who you tell about this. But if you tell anybody, one of the people has to be Desmond Leslie, which presumably is how Desmond Leslie got the information to tell George Hunt Williamson in Valor magazine. So I guess they were okay with telling a bunch of uh, spiritualist fascists who read Soulcraft publications about what happened. Mead also asks Ramon whether or not he thinks Eisenhower is sincere in his attempts to do what he's trying to do and and what kinds of pressure might be exerted on the president during this very crucial time in human history. This man, like all men of his kind in your high government positions, is the leader or is a symbol of such in your country. They are always under pressure. They cannot act alone. 
back of him in the shadows stand such individuals as Bernard Baruch and next the High Roman Catholic Church. These are the two main forces. Next in line are the powerful dictators of communism. So now we're getting into some fairly deep conspiratorial waters of the 1950s. We've got anti-Catholic conspiracy. We've got the powerful dictators of communism. But um, sort of head of the class is Bernard Baruch. And Bernard Baruch was an advisor to President Franklin D. Roosevelt during the 1930s. He was a powerful figure in finance and politics, and he was Jewish. So we've and, and usually in the 1950s, 40s and 50s, you see Burke's name being attached to various shadowy international finance conspiracy theories. So, yeah, we can kind of lump some of the BSRA stuff in with this political conspiracy system, conspiracy system, conspiracism is the word I'm looking for. So. That was a surprise to me because I didn't pick up a lot of that in the stuff I looked at for our previous episode about these folks. Now, the next question Lane has for Ramon is whether or not communism will, in fact, take over as an alternative to the utter destruction of humankind through atomic horror. There will be no such thing. Under no circumstances will this take place. It will be Russia that must go down. And I do not mean the Russian people. I mean the communistic regime. This is a deadly force to the individual's existence. But so is Catholicism. The communists are bad, but so are the Catholics, right? So it's it's tempting to sort of of historically look at this and say, well, anti-communism and anti-Catholicism do those go together or not, because the Roman Catholic Church was fairly anti-communist during the 20th century. On the other hand, American right-wing elements were opposed to both Catholicism and communism. So there are there's a Venn, there are various Venn diagrams overlapping here. Also in the prognostication and prophecy category, Lane has a question about whether or not uh, things are going to go wrong in Southeast Asia. Do you foresee our being drawn into the Indo-Chinese conflict? Armed intervention? No, not armed intervention. This I do not say. I see great supplies and occasional individuals, advisors, and those who are adventurers joining up. But as for your country sending troops and such? No, not unless China and Russia join forces. That's not too likely though, is it? No, it is not, because the Chinese communism is not on the same level as Russian communism, and whether the Western world makes these facts known or not is of little difference. Before the czars and priests of the Russian churches were thrown out, the Russian people lived in total slavery. Communism as a government has brought great relief to the masses, though it has also meant a great deal of pressure to the individual's way of growth. Remember, the Russian people are almost entirely illiterate in those past times, now are largely educated, at least academically so. The modes of action of the individual are greatly impeded, but his economic way of life is far superior to what it was while under the iron rule of Tsarism and the Russian Orthodox Church. So that one didn't age well. The United States would be drawn into armed conflict in Southeast Asia. Today, we call it the Vietnam War. But regardless of what it's called, Ramon Natali did not uh, did not foresee that. So here's the big question. Are we going to find out about the aliens or Ethereans or whatever you want to call them? Is President Eisenhower at the moment planning to release information about the arrival of the Ethereans in the coming months? He is. But in doing so, providing pressure is not put upon him, he will have to be very careful how he words his thoughts. Otherwise, you will have widespread panic. I just wanted to ask if his so-called rulers would allow him to express himself as freely as he thought advisable. This will be up to him. I do not know. I do not know. So as we know from studying contactee stuff for the last, gosh, almost five years here on The Saucer Life, sometimes the Space Brothers or the Ethereans or the aliens or whoever have some wisdom for us. What are the odds that people in charge would heed that wisdom. Is it your opinion that our governmental authorities and also the great ones in the world of science will conform to ideas and restrictions suggested or urged on them or commanded by the Ethereans? Yes, they will. So that research on the high explosives will at least have some limit put upon them. 
Yes, I do. But in order to do this, Catholicism will have to be taken in hand. It will have to cease as a threatening faction against communism. I don't understand, Natalie. What will have to cease? Catholicism will have to cease as a constant threatening faction against communism before any real lasting peace can be made. Catholicism acts as a constant irritant and will not let the political leaders bring peace. Do you think there is any power able to enforce that upon the Catholic hierarchy without extreme violence? It is in the scheme of things that certain measures will be taken by the Aetherians to disseminate the ideas of Catholicism being the only godly force on earth, and then destroy the teachings. In using the word disseminate, you mean nullifying or scattering the Catholic dogma? Yes. Yes. And that's the end of the Ramon Natale part of this. Also, that's not what disseminate means. But I think it's interesting that we do have this thread of anti-Catholicism that emerges in this channeled information. That's going to expand from Catholicism to Christianity more broadly when we come back from the break and the Ramon Natale control is replaced by the Yada de Shiite, who is a different sort of character. And then we're going to look at how this Eisenhower, uh, some snapshots of how the Eisenhower at Edwards Air Force thing, so Edwards Air Force Base thing, rather, developed over the years. We'll be right back. We'll be back in a week fielding your questions and comments about this episode. And then on the next regular episode, I'm not sure yet. I've got a couple options. I think we're going to be looking at Bill Moore's speech at the MUFON conference in 1989. Somebody threw it up online saying, just discovered the, the text of the speech from the MUFON newsletter. And I'm sitting here looking at my hard drive, seeing my PDFs of it from like 10 years ago and thinking, is this new? But I also have the, the audio of it. It's a fun story. Yeah, I've decided. I think we are going to be doing that one. Now, when that next episode will appear is going to be a bit later than usual. Uh, June is very packed, and so we here at Chizo Media are readjusting schedules and reshuffling and doing some planning. We haven't had a break in a while, so um, it's sort of our mid-year break as opposed to our year-end break. So next week, questions and comments, and then probably a week off. There's going to be something coming in the feed. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it's not going to be one of our regular episodes and then back on the regular schedule after that. If you like The Saucer Life and want more, you can support us in exchange for bonus content from both this show and our sister show, Great Lakes Lore. You can check it out at patreon.com slash chizomedia or via the link in the show notes or Google Saucer Life Patreon. Any way you get there, you can find it. You can check out past episodes of the show at saucerlife.com or on your favorite podcast app. And we are on Twitter and Instagram at Saucer Life. And you can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com. Any of those means or methods to get us feedback is great. You can contact us by post with non-poisonous, non-exploding, completely legal gifts at Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, 4848. Zero. And now let's get back to the Yada de Shiite. So the Yada de Shiite uh, really has almost nothing to say about the Murak Edwards Air Force Base thing, but we've got some interesting information about communism and the political machinations of the planet. And this is just, I, I don't know how many times I can say this. I was not expecting this. And don't worry, we're going to get back to Eisenhower and Edwards Air Force Base and, and, and things like that again. But yeah, not expecting this at all. There is a great strain between communism and the democracies. But this is because the political factions that exist do not want the Russian way of life to be at all associated with those of the democratic way, because this will lead to free thinking. And free thinking becomes a danger to those of you who rule you. We of the inner circle have no feelings about isms. Communism, democracy, socialism, fascism, they're all isms, and they're not worth a damn. There's only one, and only one, that is worthwhile for man's growth, and that is the ism of understanding, of love, which gives the whole human race a chance to grow. Christianity has never given anything to the people. As it is, it has caused more war, more bloodshed than anything else we know of. If it were not for Catholicism, 
communism and the democracies could get together and live in peace. So once again, Catholicism is the problem. But communism's bad too, but not as bad as not just Catholicism, but everything associated with Catholicism. Communism one can get over. It is a mild ailment. But Catholicism and the whole Christian religion as it is, and has been for several hundreds and hundreds of years, is a very deadly disease, eating like cancer the brain and controlling the mind. There is no escape from it, even into the what you call death state. The anti-Catholicism and anti-Christianity seems a little a little extreme compared to some contactee stuff, but it does kind of seem in line with some of the more politically extreme spiritualism that we've seen, especially from William Dudley Pelley, who of course claimed a Christian viewpoint, but developed a spiritual tradition that bore only a, a slight sort of passing resemblance to Christianity. And to sort of round out our coverage of the Yada de Shiite, we've got, uh, we had the anti-Catholicism, we had the anti-communism. Now let's have a little bit of anti-Semitism cloaked in concern about the Arab-Israeli conflict. We read much of the Arab trouble with the Jews, and of course our papers over here aren't allowed to give us the Arab side of it, only the Jewish side because of the power, money, and advertising, such as you know. What is the actual condition over there as far as the troubles are concerned? Very bad, because the Jewish people want to spread out and possess as much land as is possible. They want full control. They feel strong now because they do have a foothold in the Holy Land, so called. It was predicted in your Christian Bible that they would return to the Holy Land, huh? Times have changed, reason and purposes. Each race of people desires to dominate other races of people. The Jewish people and the Arabs have been enemies since time that I can remember. When they came down out of the Himalaya mountains, the Jewish people, or the black people, the crimes they committed everywhere they went were of an atrocious nature. They attempted to rule by force and enslavement. That is why they were enslaved when they attempted to attack and enslave the Babylonians. Everywhere they went, they have caused terrible suffering, for they have no belief in a higher self, though the rulers in the beginning, such men as Moses, tried to bring them this idea. The thought lasted for a period of time, and they held them under some control, but it is not there anymore. They have no belief in survival, therefore they will have no reason to do anything to better their condition. There will be much trouble yet between the Jewish people and the Arabs. India must lose a great number of her people if she expects to survive as a nation. She can't feed as many as she has, is that right? That is right, nor can the world continue to feed her. This is also true of China. I thought you had said here quite some time ago, though, that great numbers of the Chinese and the Indians would be annihilated. They still will. This must take place if these nations expect to come back, but I do not see them coming back. I see these nations dying more and more. Now, I'm in the loop on most anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and, and sort of bad historical takes on things, but this is the, the first time, I think, that I've heard that the, uh, the Babylonian captivity was the result of the ancient Israelites attempting to attack the Babylonians. Um, I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure if it was a sort of war that led to the enslavement. I don't know. It, it, mm, that strikes me as... As kind of uh, as kind of wrong, but that's the uh, the Yad the Shiites' point of view of these things. And again, nothing in his portion of the channeling about Eisenhower and Edwards Air Force Base. So why did I go into this political stuff? Why didn't I just end it with Gerald Light's letters? Because this, I, you know, and I might have not have done it this way if we hadn't already covered William Dudley Pelly and and sort of teasing out these um, more politically conspiratorial and. Um, you know, anti-Semitic and, and anti-communist and this sort of strand of conspiratorial thought that has some crossover with the UFO field. And the, the BSRA folks are, are kind of tangential to the UFO field. Again, we've got, we've got like many different Venn diagrams going on, but um, an interesting angle, I think. So the Mead Lane letter story sort of percolates and, and, and simmers in various UFO books during the 1950s and the 1960s and even into the 1970s, usually just presented as a, did this happen? We don't really know sort of thing. But then in the late 1970s or 1980, 
actually, in a book about the Roswell incident by Bill Moore and Charles Berlitz, we get the Mead Lane Gerald Light correspondence dredged up again and connected to the supposed crash at Roswell and the collection of the alien bodies and the crashed craft. So we, we've got some Venn diagrams overlapping. Again, this story from the 50s and this new UFO mythology that is taking shape in the late 70s and 1980s and will dominate things into the 21st century. Eisenhower, however, eventually learned of the rumors of the allegedly crashed saucer and proceeded to take some action. Not surprisingly, according to sources as close to the topic as we can get, he repeatedly encountered a split within the military establishment on this matter. We can imagine the reasoning among opponents of declassification. It would be advisable to keep the saucer incident silent. It is supremely important not just for scientific interest in extraterrestrials, but for national security. Any nation that could figure out how the disks operated and could duplicate their maneuverability would have a missile defense and delivery system inestimably in advance of the systems presently developed or even logically contemplated, and would therefore be in a position to control the planet Earth. So we're getting elements of what is going to be the developing conspiracy theory about UFOs and the government in the 1950s, that Eisenhower knew something, Eisenhower might have seen something, but there is a split between different factions of the military and intelligence worlds that want different things, different levels of cover-up or disclosure or things along those lines. Berlitz and Moore go into detail with extensive quotations from Gerald Light's letter and then discuss its startling implications. Assuming that this letter is not a hoax, there are several key points which seem to emerge as one examines it, not the least of which is the question of who this Gerald Light might be and what he was doing at Edwards with the three reasonably well-known figures he names. Unfortunately, almost nothing is known about Light himself aside from the fact that Mead Lane, recipient of the letter, described him once in an early BSRF publication as a gifted and highly educated writer and lecturer. I was going to take Burlitz and Moore to task a little bit for their we don't know anything about Gerald Light cop out, but we really don't know a lot about Gerald Light. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to an article about Gerald Light and the Ethereans from Hakan Blomquist's blog. I, I can never pronounce his name, but he has a very interesting blog that covers a lot of contactee subjects. And this is a good article that kind of goes down the Gerald Light rabbit hole in, in a way that I'm not prepared to do. So I will definitely throw a link out there to that. So there things were in the 1980s with Eisenhower possibly going to California to look at wreckage. And then in the late 80s, we get John Lear's claims where you have Eisenhower going to Holloman Air Force Base in the 60s. And later, he adjusts this to 1954 at Edwards Air Force Base. You get Bill Cooper basically echoing Lear's claims and adding the wrinkle of both of these men, adding the wrinkle that Eisenhower made a deal with the aliens. We got their technology in exchange. They could mutilate cattle and abduct humans. And then in the mid 1990s, we get a guy named Phil Schneider, who we talked about in our episode on underground bases. Um, I urge you to get Adam Go Rightly's new book, Saucers, Spooks and Kooks for more on Phil Schneider. But he gave a speech which was heavily circulated where he gives this treaty an actual name. Anyway, this all led up to uh, uh, later on, about six, eight years later, uh, uh, 1954, uh, during the Eisenhower administration, uh, led to a uh, interesting treaty uh, called the Grieta 1954 Treaty. Uh, it was the Alien Human Treaty. And uh, you know, supposedly the aliens had come in and exchanged technology, and they'd uh, want to take an occasional human being and a few head of cows and accurate books were supposedly to be kept and uh, all this kind of stuff and, uh, and of course eventually all that broke down and uh, uh, aliens are notorious for being uh, liars, even greater liars than uh, so-called in quote we humans are uh, so uh, uh, alien treaties are often uh, uh, just not even the pieces of paper they're written on they're just really kind of worthless Remember that, folks. Alien treaties, not worth the paper they're printed on because the aliens are 
totally using paper. So what Phil Schneider is doing there, I think, is taking the John Lear, Bill Cooper stuff and claiming that, you know, this is his own original knowledge, adding his own twist to it in some ways. Uh, the the word, the Griotta Treaty, the name, I can't prove this. Um, I saw some stuff, some documents, and I sound like, I sound like one of these guys, right? I saw some documents. No, but I'm like, you know, things on the internet. And I have a feeling at some point, somebody called this the Granada Treaty, like Granada, an actual place. And I've seen copies of this where it's clearly, there's a typo and Grieta, sort of look with the N missing from Gr- Granada, is used in a document. And I think Schneider sort of latched on to this typo and thought this was the real name. I can't prove that, that that's what happened. But, um, I think it was. So in February 2004, for the 50th anniversary of the uh, the supposed meeting between Eisenhower and the aliens at, uh, at Edwards, the Washington Post did a story highlighting the theories of Michael Sala, who you might know as one of the leading exponents of exopolitics. In fact, I, I think he claims to have coined the term exopolitics and and his theories about uh, about Eisenhower. And they're, they're sort of looking at Salah's ideas about this meeting, which are sort of a mix of everything that had come before about the meeting, or almost everything, as we'll see, and some of his own ideas. But they also take a more balanced view. They're not just giving Salah a platform to talk about Eisenhower at Edwards Air Force Base, because there's also another side of the story side of the story that what Eisenhower was doing that night in California when he was supposedly meeting with aliens was that it's what was claimed later at the time that he was having some dental work done. Of course, the Associated Press sent out, accidentally sent out supposedly a hoax story that Ike was dead, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, Fake news, right? But the Washington Post is taking a balanced approach to this story. The Ike met with E.T.'s theory is advanced by Michael Sala, a former American university professor who now runs the Peace Ambassador Program at AU's Center for Global Peace. The Ike went to the dentist theory is advanced by the folks at the Dwight D. Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas, and by James M. Mixon, a dentist, professor of dentistry, and historian of presidential dental work. I've often wondered how one gets to be a historian of presidential dental work. I think that's pretty Uh, Pretty interesting. So the Washington Post story says that there are some facts that are absolutely part of the record. Eisenhower went to Palm Springs on a golf vacation in February 1954 on the night of the 20th. After dinner, he made an, an unscheduled departure from the ranch where he was staying. The next morning, he was at church in Los Angeles, and his spokesman said that Ike had visited the dentist the previous night. Now, because of supposedly some records missing from the uh, Eisenhower papers, or no mention of this in the Eisenhower papers, when supposedly every little thing a president ever does is written down, um, people have, have seized on this as you know, evidence that he was doing something secret. And if he was doing something secret on the same night that he supposedly met with aliens, then he must have met with aliens. Aliens. So the post then goes on to explain who Sala is and what his views of the situation are. Sala, who has a PhD in government from the University of Queensland and is native Australia, doesn't believe it. He figures the dentist trip was just a cover story. He believes Ike went to Edwards Air Force Base where he met with two ETs with white hair, pale blue eyes, and colorless lips. These aliens, nicknamed Nordics in UFO circles because they resemble Scandinavian humans, traveled to Edwards from another solar system in a flying saucer, and Sala says they spoke to Eisenhower. There was telepathic communication, says Sala, as he sits in his suburban Falls Church living room. It's as though you're hearing a person, but they're not speaking. The Nordics offered to share their superior technology and their spiritual wisdom with Ike if he would agree to eliminate America's nuclear weapons. They were afraid we might blow up some of our nuclear technology, Sala says, and apparently that does something to time and space, and it impacts on extraterrestrial races on other planets. Ike declined the ET's offer because he did not want to give up the nukes. Sometime later in 1954, Ike reached a deal with another race of extraterrestrials known as the Greys, allowing them to capture earthling cattle and humans for medical experiments, provided that they returned the humans safely home. Since then, Sala says, the Greys have kidnapped millions of humans. This is just the same story rewarmed from Lear and Cooper with 
a little bit of a twist that there are two different alien races, one more friendly than the other. This is the exopolitics way, right? You remember when we talked about Richard Boylan back in the day, there's a whole galaxy federation of, of different of different groups that are out there. Now, beginning in the 1980s, the Eisenhower Library in, uh, in Abilene, Kansas, started getting so many requests about this supposed meeting between Ike and the aliens that they had to sort of assign a person to, um, to, to look at those things. His name is Herb Pankratz. I think that's how you pronounce it. And he specialized in transportation. And, and then they said, well, you're the transportation guy. Ike's a big transportation guy with the, the interstate highway system and things like that. So they just sort of added UFOs to his portfolio of things he was paying attention to. And he explained to the Post what he thought was interesting about these stories over the years. It's interesting how these stories have changed, Pankrantz noted in an email. Initially, the accounts claimed the president made a secret trip to Edwards Air Force Base to view the remains of aliens who had crashed at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Later stories then claimed he had actually visited with live aliens. So that's what the archivist finds interesting. What I find interesting is that somehow, some when, somewhere, I think around the mid-90s when Phil Schneider began telling the story, Gerald Light kind of disappears from the scene, doesn't he? You see references to Gerald Light in historical overviews of the Eisenhower at Edwards phenomenon like this, like an article from Magonia Magazine by Curtis Peoples, who wrote the fairly good book Watch the Skies several years ago. I'll include a link to that article in the show notes as well. But as far as the places where there are claims that Eisenhower actually met with aliens, you don't see light out there anymore. And another connection that just occurred to me as I was working on this, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me before, I wonder to what degree the whole narrative of Eisenhower at one point turning down an offer of help from the aliens for one reason or another, to what degree was that lifted from Frank Strange's valiant Thor stories where Eisenhower and Nixon um, refused alien help in reforming America's economic system because they didn't want it to affect the economic system, if you'll remember that from our valiant Thor episode. But now Gerald Light seems to have vanished from the scene. So the article goes on to talk about the, the dental history of Eisenhower and, and the fact that there was an article that talks about his many dental problems, including the one uh, broken, I think it was a broken crown that he suffered when he was in Palm Springs, not meeting with aliens. There's an article, um, A History of Dwight D. Eisenhower's Oral Health, published in the November 95 issue of the Bulletin of Dental History. Now, they did reach out to the family. They uh, talked to Eisenhower's son, John S.D. Eisenhower, um, retired army general and author of several books on history, including, I think, my favorite history of the Mexican War, uh, So Far From God, which is a really good history of the Mexican War. Um, they reached out via email to uh, retired General Eisenhower and asked if his father had ever mentioned meeting with aliens, and Eisenhower had this response. No. And that was the entirety of the statement. So, as we've seen, or what we've seen, is that at some point, Gerald Light vanishes from the scene here, and the people who claim this meeting are either reporting what later people have claimed, people like John Lear, Bill Cooper, although you never hear those names because those names have, to a degree, been de discredited, especially Cooper, in many circles. But you also hear from whistleblowers who sometimes say that they have seen papers about this. Um, or experienced it themselves, people like Schneider. But we also have other whistleblowers who I had never heard of until I started Googling around, including uh, Henry W. McElroy Jr., who was a state representative from New Hampshire, who is also an Eisenhower alien whistleblower. The document I saw was an official brief to President Eisenhower. To the best of my memory, this brief was pervaded with a sense of hope, and it informed President Eisenhower of the continued presence of extraterrestrial beings here in the United States of America. The brief seemed to indicate that a meeting between the President and some of these visitors could be arranged as appropriate if desired. 
the tone of the brief indicated to me that there was no need for concern since these visitors were in no way causing any harm or had any intention whatsoever of causing any disruption then or in the future. While I can't verify the times or places or that any meeting or meetings occurred directly between Eisenhower and these visitors, because of his optimism in his farewell address in 1961, I personally believe that Eisenhower did indeed meet with these extraterrestrial off-world astronauts. So somebody showed this poor guy a copy of the Eisenhower briefing document that's been floating around since the 1980s, which we're probably going to cover on an episode where we talk about MJ-12. If I decide to wade into that, it'll pro- if you hear an episode about MJ-12, much like if I ever do an episode on Roswell, you'll know the end is near because I really don't want to wade into that. But McElroy isn't the only whistleblower. There, there's one who's very, very important and significant, and that is a woman named Laura Eisenhower. That's right, Eisenhower. She is President Eisenhower's great-granddaughter. And some YouTubers reached out to her for her opinion on what happened in 1954. There's a widespread rumor in UFOlogy circles that I've always been curious about. It's believed that President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed a peace treaty with an alien race in 1954 that might have allowed for human abductions. I mean, if this is true, it would be an explosive revelation. So I'm going to continue my investigation by speaking with Laura Eisenhower, President Eisenhower's great-granddaughter. Hi there. Hey, Laura. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Good, good. Hey, thank you for meeting with me. I've heard a lot about some, some rumors that I'm hoping you can either confirm or deny for me. I'm just going to come right out and ask you. Do you believe that your great-grandfather, Dwight D. Eisenhower, signed a treaty with extraterrestrials? It's a true story. What I have learned about Eisenhower's relationship to extraterrestrial beings and ET government treaties is that supposedly in 1954 there was a meeting at Edwards Air Force Base. Right. Uh, They seemed to have diplomatic intention. The treaties had to do with bartering exchanges of planetary goods, uh, natural resources, elements, and compounds. And it was in exchange for like things like abduction. Why would they want to abduct humans? What are they doing with that? What they need are DNA. We have a treasure of DNA that is basically a living library. And yes, we will have a Laura Eisenhower episode at some point because she is a fascinating person. But here she's kind of just reiterating the same stories that have been floating around since the late 1980s, 1987, 88 or so with John Lear. And that's the thing about Eisenhower at Edwards is that the initial letter from Light to Meade didn't have a lot of detail. And so this detail gets filled in over the years and it gets appropriated by, for example, Moore and Berlitz into being part of the Roswell experience. And Lear and Cooper mix up which airbase they're talking about at various times. And it just keeps going. I think it's a fascinating story. The Magonia article I mentioned uh, goes into it in in a more textual way because it's an article, not a podcast. And um, it's wonderful because Curtis Peoples did what I uh, always sort of thought about doing. But now I don't have to write some sort of massive article about Eisenhower at Edwards because it's been done. And I don't have to do another podcast episode about it because it's been done here as well. Thank you for listening. Remember to send in your questions and comments via social media, email, comments on the website, and we'll address them next week. Our associate producer is Simpson J. Hanover III, and The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Until next time, keep watching the skies, because the skies are watching you.